reading through the Bible in one year. Um, March 5th, Exodus 21, 1 through 22, 15. Job 29, Luke 2, 8 through 38. And 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 16, 24. I think that's the end of the book. Eh, we'll find out together. Now, here are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. <gasps> In today's age, we're talking about slavery? Yes. This is the way most people worked in this day and age. That's how it was. This wasn't people like we have in America um, or like we had in America where people were, quote, Shanghai'd, um, where they were um, stolen from their country and brought over. Um, that was the case for some people where they were um, like after a war, you went in and you took all the captives of the land and you brought them over and they were going to do your work for you. That's the way it was at that time. All right. Now, this is very different, though, because this is how you shall deal with people who are Hebrew slaves versus the other people, right? Basically saying in the family versus out of the family. Here's how it works. So when you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go free for nothing. Right? People will also sell themselves into slavery. If they have a debt to pay or they can't afford to, uh, to live in a land, they will put themselves into a... Um, into a, a basically this slave contract where they would say, um, you know, I will go work for you. And in turn, you're going to give me a place to live. You're going to take care of my needs and I'm going to serve you in much the same way that I would serve today a business, right? Let's say that you work, go to your office and at your office, they have uh, housing and dormitories and food and all that stuff. Right. And, um, Basically, what they do is they they take care of your needs, your medical needs, everything else. Um, and because of that, you work for them, right? So you work to them um, as you would under the Lord, right? That's what we're talking about here. All right, let's go on. Um, now, if he comes in single, he'll go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and the children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door or doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall be a slave forever. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, now basically at that point, you're also saying, I want to become part of your family. That's another way to put that, right? When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall go out um, as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. Um, he shall have no right to sell her to foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. She's free to go. Whoever strikes a man um, so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which he must flee. Should these cities of refuge, we'll get to those. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So he can't be before God. You take him out and you stone him to death. Whoever strikes his father or his mother um, shall be put to death. Now, this isn't just like heading them, right? This is um, like striking with an intent to kill, right? Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. See how this one line right here completely negates um, slavery as it was in America or in Jamaica, like when all the people from Ireland were uh, kidnapped and used as slaves in Jamaica in the sugar plantations, right? Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now, this curse line here, there's a note on this um, that says, or dishonors or reviles, right? The note on this is a little weird. Um the Hebrew translation for the fifth commandment, uh, the Hebrew for the word curse is made to note another form uh, or of overt dishonor to parents in addition to spoken curses. Um, 
basically it's the same thing as um, if you are continually not just, you know, using foul language, but if you are basically threatening your parents. There you go. When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and the man does not die, but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again, walks outdoors with a staff, he who struck him shall be clear. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and have him, um, sorry, and shall have him thoroughly healed. But when a man strikes a slave, this is important. Remember American slavery. There's a lot of abuse, right? If they read the Bible, follow biblical laws, none of these things would happen. When a man strikes a slave, male or female, with a rod and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. Right? But if the slave, the slave survives a day or two, he's not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there's no harm, so the kids come out and they're alive, right? Um, or child comes out and it's alive. Uh, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay them as the judges determine. But if there is harm, if the baby dies, you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So if you cause a woman to miscarry, or if you cause that child to die, you shall die. Scripture's clear. If a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. When an ox gores a man or woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in, and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also should be put to death. He should have known better and taken care of this first. If a ransom is posed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. If it gores a man's son or daughter, he should be dealt with according to the same rule. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give it uh, to their master 30 shekels of silver, the cost of a slave, and the ox shall be stoned. Uh, 2215. I was like, dang, this is a long one. Okay. When a man opens a pit, or a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make restoration. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another so that it dies, then they shall sell uh, both of them together, shall sell the live ox and share its price, and the dead beast they shall also share. Or if it is known that the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and the owner does or has not kept it in, he shall repay ox for ox, and the dead beast will be his. Right? If a man steals an ox or a sheep and sells it or kills it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. This is the standard thing for theft. You repay fivefold. Right? If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, then there should be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. Because if someone breaks into your home and you don't know what's happening and you kill him, that's one thing. But if you know you can see the guy clearly and you don't give him the opportunity to flee, or you kill him just for you know coming into your house, that's not allowed. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the beast is found alive and in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed over or lets his le uh, beast loose and it feeds another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best in his own field and is from his vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain um, or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. Even if it's completely by accident, you still started the fire and you weren't there to take care of it. You weren't responsible for what you were doing. If a man uh, gives to his neighbor um, money or goods to keep safe, and it is stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. 
If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God and show whether he is, uh, has or has not uh, put his hand uh, to his neighbor's property, like to steal it, right? For every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep safe, and it dies or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by the Lord shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath, and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. So basically, if you have something in your property, right? If, if you... Okay, well, that was a phone call. And I got confused as to what I was saying because I was on the phone call for like 10 minutes. But we're starting over. Okay, so um, if a man ceases... Um, oh, yeah, so basically you're responsible for... Oh, I know where we are. Okay, so um, if your neighbor lends you, um, say, a drill, right? Or a broom or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it gets stolen from your house, you have to pay him back. Doesn't matter if there's like, this is like the master best thief in the world and they broke into your house and you had no way to defend against it. Doesn't matter. You pay him back. That's what it comes down to, right? Because the owner shall accept the oath and he shall... Uh, bum, bum, bum. The oath. Um, oh yeah, uh, there we go. Uh, but if he is, uh, if it is stolen from him, where's my mouse? There we go. He shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn by beasts, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn. So if like a lion shows up, and you know, or um, I guess here, um, if you have sheep and uh, a pack of coyotes gets in and eats eats one of those sheep, right? And you just show it was a pack of coyotes. I couldn't help against that. Uh, if a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. If the owner is with it, he shall not make full restitution. If it was hired, it came with a tiring fee. So it came for a tiring fee. So if you rent something from somebody, that's what the hiring term means. If you're renting something from somebody, right? Um, or you're renting something to somebody, make sure you have enough in that rental fee to pay for it back if something should happen to it. All right, let's get going. Job 29. And Job again took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. When my steps were washed with butter and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. That is a slippery rock. Basically what he's saying is he's, you know, he wishes that things were back like they used to be, right? When I went out to the gate of the city, when I prepared my seat in the square, the young man saw me and withdrew and the aged rose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and laid their hand on their mouth. Um... The voice, sorry, the voice of the nobles was hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, it called me blessed. When the eye saw, it approved because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, then it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I searched out the cause of him who I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous. I made him drop his, uh, his prey from his teeth. Then I thought, I shall die in my nest. I shall multiply my days as the sand. My roots spread out to the waters with all the dew of my, sorry, with the dew all night on my branches. My glory fresh within me, or fresh with me, and my bow ever new in my hand. Men listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel. After I spoke, they did not speak again, and my word dropped upon them. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouths as for the spring rain. I smiled upon them 
when they had no confidence, and the light of my face they did not cast down. I chose their way and sat as chief. I lived like a king among his troops, like one who uh, comforts mourners. So he's saying this is what it was before, but tomorrow we're going to get to read what it's like for him now. Okay, Luke 2. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them uh, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known to them the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for the purification, uh, according to the word, sorry, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. As it is written, oh yeah, you read that one. And now to offer a sacrifice. Sorry, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is what happened if you were poor. If you didn't have a lot of money, this is what you typically give. Now, there's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and said, Blessed, uh, sorry, bless God, said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your soul also, your own soul also. So that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there is a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of of the tribe of Asher, She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. Then, as a widow, until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak well of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 16, 24. I tell you this, my brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Meaning that we're not all going to die, but all of us. Again, he's speaking to brothers here, right? Um, What he means is that we're all, um, those of us who are in the spirit or those who are Christians are going to be transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, 
But the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body, a perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do on the first day of every week, not this Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. Not so that he may prosper. It's, you know, as you do well, take a little bit of that extra that's doing well for you and set it aside for the service of other people. So that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those who, um, whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should also go, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, uh, just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door uh, for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as I am, So let no one despise him and help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. He was saying, you know, be careful because he's young. He's still kind of, you know, nervous about these things. Now, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they had devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to follow, sorry, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus, and be subject, I just read that, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. For they have refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love of the Lord, let him be accursed. O Lord, sorry, our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen.